Hey, Joe Hartman again with interoperativeneuromonitoring.com and Sentient Medical Systems. This is the fourth video for the CNIM crash course, and we're going to go over motor and boat potentials. Uh, back when I took the exam, MEPs were definitely prevalent. It was something well established in the operating room, but we did not have any uh, guidelines yet. Since that time, uh, McDonald has wrote some guidelines. I highly suggest you find those, read those, you know, print them out, tear it out, uh, underline everything, make sure you have that known back and forth. It's a pretty good resource. So transcranial motor vote potential, have to know how to set it up. So the stimulator is the anode over the cortex to be stimulated, cathode as the reference. Of course, that flips if we start doing internal capsule or white track matter approximation or stimulation, we use the cathode to stimulate. But when we are over the gray matter for transcranial motor vote potentials, we use anodal stimulation. Head leads can vary. You can use the C1 to C2 setup or C3 to C4, uh, CZ3 uh, to C4, or the vertex to a ZZ plus 6 centimeters. So the C1 to C2 or C2 to C1 gets good response. It has less uh, depth penetration will get absorbed by the scope and skin more readily than others and causes less patient movement typically, but you just have to stimulate at a higher intensity. Go a little bit wider to C3, 4, or 4, 3. Uh, uh, this penetrates deeper, has less shunting, uh, will stimulate down into the white tracks more readily. Uh, downside is patient movement is usually greater. The central to the C3 or C4, this is good if you are doing uh, motor vote potentials in cranial nerves. So most people do it off of facial nerve uh, muscles. It helps isolate one side versus the other, but it is typically a little bit more difficult to get extremity uh, recordings. And then the vertex to another midline plus six centimeters. This one is uh, better for getting lower extremity, but overall it's not is uh, clinically useful for recording motor vote potentials. The number of trains is three to nine. That's the number of stimulations that you have. If you are under anesthesia, you will not be able to record a motor vote potential CMAP until you start getting around that three or four train areas. So when we initially brought it into the operating room, we tried it with a single pulse and we were unable to reliably record MEPs. Uh, that is not the same for D-wave monitoring. That's where you have the recording electrode directly on the spinal cord, and it only takes a direct uh, impulse in order to record a action potential. So we do not need multiple pulses. We can just use a train of one for D-waves. Interpulse interval is the time interval in between each of these uh, stimulations. And like we showed with the action potential and the absolute and relative refractory periods, the amount of change that you place on the interstimulus interval will uh, decipher how well you utilize spatial and temporal summation. I can tell you just uh, generally speaking, a shorter interpulse interval, like one to two, you're more likely to get upper extremities versus lower extremities, and you're probably able to get proximal muscle groups a little bit better than if you had longer ones. Uh, interpulse interval of two, that's typically where I start. It's more of your overall general uh, best chance of getting responses, especially if you're at a, uh, a higher intensity. But you can also switch out to a later interstimulus interval, which seems to get lower extremities a little bit better, uh, like four milliseconds. Uh, when you make this move, if you especially if you start from one and go to four, you'll notice that these large amplitude uh, by sometimes triphasic or maybe just a couple of turns in your C maps will now become long uh, duration, very polyphasic, and a little bit smaller in amplitude just by changing the interstimulus interval. Pulse duration, uh, 50 to 500 microseconds. Some equipment regulates you and only will allow you 50 or 75 microseconds. Uh, that's, like we said, with the pulse duration, the reason why is uh, the longer the duration, the higher the probability of burns. Uh, 
Stimulation intensity, you can go up to 1,000 volts. Impedance, less than 5 kilo ohms for both stimulating and recording electrodes. Band pass is pretty wide open at 20 to 2,000 hertz because remember these are very large amplitudes. We don't have to worry too much about noise. So uh, we like to trigger one response to collect the CMAP so there's no averaging. Uh, analysis time is 100 uh, milliseconds total. If we think about how long it took the SSCP lower extremity to get up to the cortex, that was around 40. Uh, this is traveling down very similar uh, pathways, or when it gets to the peripheral nerves, that is, definitely has different pathways centrally. And it's a little bit deeper, depending on your intensity and your uh, stimulation electrode placement, but it can start you know, in the internal capsule or somewhere in the brainstem versus an SSCP, which starts in the lower extremity and all the way to the cortex but it will have a very similar latency. Notch filter, off again, we don't need it. Signal filters, none. Averaging, none. We don't need those. As a matter of fact, if you have some of these kind of filter settings on, sometimes it will uh, mask your proximal or facial muscle ones, the ones that come in pretty early, that you need to decipher between the stem artifact and a muscle response. So you might end up seeing what is actually a stim artifact and calling it a muscle response, which is uh, not the best way to practice. So my recommendation is to take off filters from your MEPs. Stimulation of a motor evoked potential. The anode more effectively stimulates the pyramidal cells of the cortex because of its ability to induce hyperpolarization of the apical dendrite and depolarization of the axon hillock. This orientation enhances hyperpolarization of the cortical surface and depolarization of the deep layer of the cortical gray matter. So if you remember that picture of the neuron, we had the dendrites, then we had the cell body or soma, and then we had the axon hillock coming down all the way to the axon. So here it is saying that you have a hyperpolarization at the cortex where the dendrites are and, and a depolarization at the axon hillock. That's why anodal stimulation is preferred over cathodal stimulation. It has to do with the orientation of these pyramidal cells uh, that we stimulate that are largely found in the primary uh, motor strip, but they are found elsewhere too. Here we also see the picture of the C1, C2. Uh, we can see that the wider electrode placement has a high propensity of deeper stimulation. No problem at all for uh, a cervical or a lumbar case. Something you really need to consider if you're doing something a little bit higher up. MEP head leads. Head leads are at the motor strip or the central C plus one centimeter or C plus two centimeters, also called M. Uh, that's how I personally uh, notate my MEP leads electrodes. I call it M1, M2, or M3, M4. Uh, but it's, it's sometimes used uh, is the same thing, but if you call it C3, C4, that should be a little bit posterior placement than an M1, M2, M3, M4. So the first head lead placement also is uh, C3, C4, most efficient with less current shunting, might promote deep stimulation and stronger bites. C1, C2 has shunting through the skull may occur, requiring increased intensity, less current spread, less movement. CZ to C3 and CZ to C4, a unilateral response, but may show false asymmetries. Less facial muscle directly stimulated may be better for cranial nerve monitoring. And the vertex to the CZ plus six centimeters is best for lower extremities, but might not stimulate upper extremities. Lower responses on D waves, so might be less efficient. So when we place a recording electrode on the spinal cord and record D waves, we see that this last montage or last electro placement setup has smaller D waves and uh, we can kind of carry that over into our regular transcranial motor vote potentials recording from a muscle and know that that is not something that is uh, useful in, in generating a response. The number of trains. One train will not produce a, an indirect wave or an I wave. It may be enough in the awake patient, but not in the anesthetized patient. Reasonable starting points might be five pulses for leg MEPs and three or four pulses when only hand or facial responses are monitored. 
Uh, typically, that doesn't happen a whole lot. In my experience, at least, we usually are doing all extremities. I waves are present after multiple trains and low anesthesia. Temporal summation produce progressive motor unit recruitment with three through five pulse trains. Spatial summation occurs as each train lowers the threshold for the answer neurons. So we see the picture on the right at a train of three, still just a, a, a small response that is unreliably used. We come up to four. Again, now we're getting something replicating, and then five, we're getting something reliable. Uh, interpulse interval. The optimal interpulse interval appears to vary with anesthetic depth, stimulus intensity, and the targeted muscles and the individual you're stimulating in. Light anesthesia permitting abundant eye waves, unusually long intervals of eight milliseconds or more can be optimal by allowing full eye wave expression before the next pulse. So if we were having a mildly, mildly sedated patient and you're running motors, which almost never happens, uh, you could increase your interpulse interval way higher than what you typically would to get better responses. In my experience, I'm typically running MEPs on a deep patient, mainly because this is a very painful uh, stimulation that we're giving them, so we don't want to do it on, the, on an awake patient or somebody that can remember it. So scale back down to that one to four in our stimulus interval. Regular surgical anesthesia, cortical spinal drive, depends mainly on D-wave that have an absolute and relative refractory period. So just a picture showing the different head lead placements, showing the D wave recording on the surface electrode, and then showing what it looks like on a muscle MEP CMAP. Interpulse interval. The optimal ISI for complete recovery of the second D wave amplitude and latency is around four milliseconds using a moderate stimulus intensity with a duration of 500 microseconds. So I got this from a paper that had that exact line in there, but it does not specify what a moderate stimulus intensity is. Uh, so if you're going a little bit higher then maybe two milliseconds pulse duration works better. Because of the alpha motor neuron is optimally bombarded when the train of equal stimuli elicits D waves of equal amplitudes, the optimal ISI for muscle activation is expected to be four milliseconds. Again, uh, maybe this works out in a TIVA, but if you have some gas on board, maybe it doesn't. Um, there's a bunch of factors that is included in what ends up being the best, and it's just something that you have to figure out on each patient on an individual basis but those are good guidelines. Interpulse interval again with medium intensity trans, uh, trans electrical stimulation, D waves do not show full amplitude recovery between pulses until a four to five millisecond interval that should therefore promote cortical drive and muscle MEPs. So if you remember the action potential picture that we showed, if we're stimulating at two milliseconds, we're probably well into that uh, relative refractory period. And the D wave hasn't been able to fully, uh, the next D wave hasn't been able to fully recover. We had to stimulate just to bring it to threshold and you might not get a full D wave amplitude. Full D wave recovery may also occur when a two millisecond interval is used when high intensity is used. So we have to actually drive to drive that area and surrounding areas to make sure that we get uh, an appropriate D-wave. Despite incomplete D-wave recovery, a one millisecond interval can uh, produce large hand MEPs. However, the same may not be true for leg muscles. This suggests that other factors may be involved, such as segmental alpha motor neuron summation properties, motor unit synchronicity, or I-wave facilitation. So on the Bottom picture here on the left, we have the interpulse interval uh, in milliseconds, and then we have the representative amplitude. So at one, like I said, we have a pretty large amplitude that does not have many turns. Two, uh, here we are with a, a much better looking amplitude, it had 
more time to get through that refractory period. At three and four, we still have very good looking amplitudes. It's just they're becoming more polyphasic and longer in duration. And then we see as we go all the way down five, six, seven, uh, we start losing some of that amplitude size. Convert, and that's in the upper extremity hand. Conversely, in the lower extremity, we start to see nice looking C maps right around three or four, where we have larger amplitudes and it's polyphasic. Um, so again, this is a case by case basis. I would say that it's typically harder to get MEPs in the lower extremity versus the upper extremity. And so that is where that two to four range is probably the best uh, starting point. If you're uh, utilizing MEPs for peripheral nerves and you're doing an upper extremity, uh, then you may elect to do a interpulse interval closer to one to two in order to get those proximal muscles and large amplitudes in the upper extremity versus the lower extremity. Analysis time, the onset depends on intensity level, the height of the patient, temperature of the patient, and integrity of the motor pathway. Upper and lower extremities are typically used together. A 100 millisecond window or 10 milliseconds per division is typically used. If monitoring thoracic spine and below, the upper extremity act as control. If monitoring the cervical spine, the traps can act as a control. So remember the traps are coming from cranial nerve 11, which is rostral to the surgical area. Uh, there is some uh, newer type information coming out that a portion of the motor part, uh, innervation to the traps is coming through that cervical, you know, C3, 4 area that's typically thought to just be uh, sensation control but there seems to be some branch of motor going to the traps and, and some smaller percentage through that area as well. Just something for you to know. Amplitude can be measured from highest amplitude to lowest amplitude or curve area of waves. Nothing standardized there. Still stated they are from 10 microvolts to 1,000 microvolts. Often substantial try-to-trial variability happens in each case, and the high signal-to-noise ratio makes averaging unnecessary so that single trial responses are most commonly monitored. Uh, if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that this person is only using a train of about, looks like five, but they have a pretty prolonged inner stimulus interval. Uh, if you it's increase your inner stimulus interval time, the duration of your MEPs could overlap some of your proximal muscles, which is happening in that left trap. So in this case, they may be okay with it. They're still more than capable of interpreting it. But if we start to see some stimulus artifact uh, overriding some of that amplitude, they may elect to decrease their inner stimulus interval to see if they can get something reproducible and reliable uh, in all the muscles that they're monitoring for the case as well as their control, which they're using the trap for in this instance. Pulse duration. Short pulses or 0.05 milliseconds have MEP thresholds about 35% lower stimulation levels. Longer pulses appear to speed D wave recovery between closely timed pulses. Uh, must be cautious when using a longer pulse width, inner stimulus interval, and number of trains the artifact may overlap the facial or proximal limb muscles like we saw in that last picture. Stimulus intensity. Stimulation is usually adjusted to clear super threshold MEPs in all targeted muscles. Another used intensity level is set at the threshold of the last recruited muscle. Supermaximal stimulation is not commonly used at this time. Uh, so the fact that people aren't doing super maximal stimulation does kind of uh, reduce your reliability of uh, using a percentage decrease in MEPs. Uh, if you were going to do that, you would want to know what maximal intensity is, maximal amplitude is, and then try to decipher loss of axonal function off of that baseline. So uh, this makes for confusion when uh, the trying to prove alarm criteria depending on other settings. 200 volts might be a good starting point. Uh, 
do not go over a thousand volts with a short pulse duration. So those are guidelines for where to start with and where to go with your stimulation intensity. When the intensity of the stimulus is increased, electric current activates the cortical tract deeper within the brain and the latency of the D wave becomes shorter. As currents become stronger, more I waves are introduced. 100% corresponds uh, to 750 volts of stimulator output. So in the picture above, we see that the decrease in latency of the D wave is we have a larger volts output and we see uh, I waves starting to come in right at that 50% area and are much larger in amplitude and, and more in number when we start getting even higher. Stimulation intensity again, three favorable points that are susceptible to depolarization of the cortical spinal tract is the cortex and subcortex with weak electrical stimulation, the internal capsule with moderate electrical stimulation, and the brainstem and foramen magnum with very strong electrical stimulation. So what we're saying here is uh, intensity and duration dependence. You can have some pretty deep stimulation uh, affecting white tracks pretty deep down there. So if you're using MEPs on a crany or uh, thalamic lesions, you have to be aware if you are uh, stimulating too deep, or at least you have to take that into consideration. The anode is preferentially the stimulating electrode. With increasing intensity of current, the cathode becomes a stimulating electrode as well. That's important to know. Uh, as you go up in, in intensity, your cathode will eventually start to produce a deep enough signal and also affect that contralateral cortex and also give some uh, CMAPs on the, what you would say, ipsilateral side of your stimulation. Because of the high impedance of the skull, only a small fraction, less than 10% of the current actually penetrates the brain. And that is also dependent upon your electrode placement uh, wider route, you'll have greater penetration versus the C1, C2 narrow positioning. Head leads and stimulation intensity. Stimulating of deep white matter uh, motor tracks may be suggested by simultaneously recording of ipsilateral and contralateral MEPs or with a higher stimulation intensity. So before we said that if you go high enough, the contralateral cathodal stimulator will also become uh, active and possibly cause, causing a CMAP, which you would see as an ipsilateral muscle response over your in, anodal side. Here again, because anodal stimulation can go so deep, it can also go uh, so wide and cause uh, summation of the contralateral internal capsule, for instance. If you're stimulating the entire internal capsule, you're going to have bilateral uh, muscle CMAPs recorded. So if you're doing something above that area and you have bilateral muscle CMAPs, you're probably stimulating too deep, at too high of an intensity. You probably want to go with a more midline uh, orientation of your electrodes with a lower stimulus intensity. Uh, so in, uh, a way that can happen is the transcolossal or uh, going through the, the white matter to the other side. More focal midline stimulation may be suitable for supertentorial neurosurgical resection procedures. Smaller MEP amplitudes are obtained coupled with longer latencies with the midline position, suggesting more focal unilateral motor cortex activation. In contrast, the exact site of stimulation is less important for spine surgery, which takes place at a more caudal location. Impedance. Recording electrodes should have an impedance less than 5 kilo ohms. Stimulating electrode impedance play an important role in the efficiency of stimulation. The average impedance of the spiral electrode, or those corkscrew electrodes, are 500 ohms. Needle electrodes are around 800 ohms, and the cup is around 1100 ohms. The higher the impedance, the more intensity required to excite the neuron, the more heat produced, the higher the risk of burns. Intrascalp bolts may lower the impedance but are too invasive. So actually in Japan, they use these bolts that just look like Home Depot screws and they're 
pretty much penetrating into the, the bone itself, decreasing the impedance, and you can have lower intensity, you know, but at what cost? Um, same with the corkscrews, those are have a lower impedance as well. Uh, they are also more invasive and cause more tissue damage. So if you cannot find the sweet spot on the first try with a corkscrew electrode, you might unscrew it and put it back in, and then you know the head ends up looking like Swiss cheese. Or you might use a bunch of corkscrew electrodes and change out the ones in the plugs to see which one uh, ends up working the best. Uh, I know a lot of people do that, and that's completely fine. For me, I choose to go, I stick with the straight electrode and then find the sweet spot. I find that more clinically valuable than, than the lower impedance. Is there anything else I should be aware of when using transcranial motor vote potentials? General safety considerations, not contraindications, but kind of general contraindications. Uh, comprehensive relative contraindications include the following. Epilepsy, cortical lesions, convexity skull defects, raised intracranial pressure, cardiac disease, proconvulsant medications or anesthetics, intracranial electrodes, vascular clips or shunts, cardiac pacemakers or other implanted biomedical devices um, like cochlear implants, stuff like that. These are things that you should be asking on your intake form when you get a consent from your patient. These are also things that they will ask you on the CNIM. Uh, you can see the patient there with uh, the bite block. It looks like they actually have two of them in there, which is probably better. The two most likely causes of problems with MEPs is not burns, um, it's bite, laceration issues, and movement during surgery. So what is your alarm criteria for motor vote potentials? Well, there is a handful of them. Uh, not, some of them have been more disputed than others, but there is no one single agreed upon uh, <clears throat> alarm criteria. So unlike the 5010 amplitude latency criteria developed for SSEPs, MEPs do not have any strict criteria. Several different criteria have been used, including changes in amplitude, threshold, and morphology. These criteria have also been tested with different locations for head leads, different stimulation parameters, and under different anesthetic protocols. So Clancy's 98 paper, they found their uh, alarm criteria to be just above threshold intensities. If increased intensity by over 100 volts that stays elevated for over one hour, it is significant. Thresholds may be different from limb to limb, and it may be different from muscle to muscle in each limb. Angelo 2003 uses multiple muscle groups to increase sensitivity, and at least one muscle group showed, should show a greater than 80% decrease change in order to be significant. McDonald's 2003 is an all or none. If you have some kind of response, then you should be fine. That's what they're saying. MEPs changed faster than SSCPs with some correlation. A later paper from Clancy disputed all the all or nothing as not sensitive to early warning signs and may put uh, partial and partial motor track injury that can lead to a delay between onset and alarm. They like the uh, 80 percent change as well now. Hillbrands 2004, a greater than 60 percent change over 10 minutes was significant for them. And then the last paper changes from a complex multiphasic wave to a bi or triphasic wave was significant. This was later disputed and they said that the morphology is not a good marker, but 80 percent loss is best. Uh, for the people that are using a percentage decrease there's still some arguments of, as to how you should actually measure a, a CMAP. Should it be from the first turn to the next one? Should it be the largest uh, peak to the largest or the lowest trough? Should it be this reef, this arc where it's an algorithmic uh, summation of all the different polyphasic waves that come out with a numeric value and to go off of that? Because like we saw, just changing the inner stimulus interval from one to four will change not only the amplitude size, but the duration of it, as well as the amount of turns. So again, this is where we're at right now. Nothing is set in stone.
MEP fades. Stable anesthesia is clearly important. However, it is critical to understand that gradual muscle MEP amplitude fading and threshold increase is normal during stable intravenous or inhalational anesthesia without scalp edema. So this is just a phenomenon that happens that is, an, is not anesthetic dependent and it's not scalp edema dependent, it's something else. Generalized motor vote potential loss is indicative of deepening anesthesia, scalp edema, and potential fade of MEPs. Why alarm criteria with a percent decrease may have a high incidence of false positives. Similar benign SSCP amplitude fading is known to occur as well. It may be worse in patients with myelopathy. And Lyons estimated that the average rate of trans electrical stimulation voltage rise necessary to maintain a 50 microvolt leg muscle MEP is about 11 volts per hour and neurologically intact and 23 volts per hour in myelopathic. So he's just showing the difference in necessity of increasing your intensity in order to get the same or similar amplitude in the normal healthy person versus the myelopathic. Why should we go with an all or none? If excitatory postsynaptic potentials reach threshold, there is a motor response. If not, then there is no motor response. As motor units are added or dropped off the compound uh, potential, MEP amplitudes change. And here's the big factor. Because the motor unit makes up the muscle response, there can be a larger drop off in the muscle response compared to cortical drive or lower motor neuron excitability. Using deterioration of the compound MEP as a predictor of injury is not particularly sensitive. However, there is proof that an unaltered MEP response provides good evidence against injury. So we're back to this whole refractory period. We stimulate, we get a response, and it, the synapses on the motor uh, cell body and the alpha motor neuron. This one single motor unit comes out and it innervates multiple muscle groups. So if we have a loss either due to ischemia or compression or anesthesia or blood pressure being a little bit too low from a, a structural or functional standpoint, we may have an uh, it's not a direct relationship of amplitude loss because of all the different motor fibers it innervates versus actual motor unit loss. So that is why some of these, uh, especially like the 50% decrease, might not be uh, very sensitive and very prone to false positives or saying something is wrong when there really isn't anything wrong. Temperature, a reduction of core temperature to 28 degrees Celsius did not significantly influence amplitudes of MEPs to multi-pulse stimulation with a train of three or five pulses whereas MEP amplitude to single pulse stimulation was significantly decreased with a reduction of core temperature. MEP latency was increased linearly with a decrease in core temperature regardless of stimulation paradigms. These results indicate that monitoring of myogenic MEP is feasible during the hypothermic condition to 28 degrees Celsius as long as the train of pulses is used for stimulation in rabbits under this propofol ketamine uh, fentanyl anesthesia. So again, this is animal studies, something we can easily kind of assume or adopt into the adult world as well. Facilitation techniques. What can be done to enhance a low amplitude response? So Janae's paper, they used a double train stimulation where a test and a stimulus are applied at, to the same site with an uh, a delay or an inner stimulus or inner train interval of 20 milliseconds between the pulse train. So what they do is they give an initial train or maybe two trains and then there is a pause or an inner train interval and then there is a longer trains uh, usually around five to seven. So what it does is it kind of primes the area and allows that full repolarization to go through and then it's ready for the next one with with that group of neurons sitting close to the threshold and you hit them with that last uh, five to seven trains and you should see a, a larger response so this picture here on the left we have the normal 
unconditioned train response, and then he placed in the uh, the same with the initial train or two with the, the following trains after that inner train interval of 21 milliseconds. Hayashi 20, uh, 2008 created a post-technic evoked potential of 50 hertz and 50 milliamps intensity with a duration of five seconds over the median and PTN. So what he's doing, he's just stimulating the nerves down in the uh, arms and, and feet and then running a motor evoked potential and they saw corresponding amplitude changes to muscles that are innervated by those nerves, whereas the quads or something that's more distant to it had no change at all. At what age can MEPs be used? D waves seem to be unable to be recorded under the age of 21, although I just saw a paper that had a D wave recorded in, I believe, a 10 month old probably due to temporal dispersion from variable conduction speeds of the young, unmyelinated central nervous system. MEPs have been reported to, uh, reported to be recorded in young as four to 11 months. There is no current age set limit. Lieber in 2006 did show that younger children, especially smaller ones, took more stimulation to gather a response, probably due to immature corticospinal tracts. He advised extreme care to make sure that the anesthesia and the intraoperative monitoring is set up to produce the best waves for MEPs in these kids. The young and elderly have shown to need more intensity to generate a response. So if you are in the pediatric center, just be advised that uh, it's not atypical to need to use a little bit more intensity or juice to get your CMAP. What muscle strength do you need in order to get a good response? Uh, muscle MEPs could not be obtained in any patient in whom muscle power was two out of five or less, but were obtained from a nine, uh, from 91.4 percent of patients with a muscle power of four or five or more. Uh, muscle MEPs were obtained in some patients with a muscle power of three out of five. So this is where your intake history and speaking to your surgeon is going to make sense and correlate with uh, your recordings. MEPs for peripheral nerve stimulation. EMGs are considered the best option that we have for peripheral nerve root and uh, nerve irritation. A study by Line in 2010, he showed that there was about a 50% decrease in MEPs of the ligated, actually ligated nerves of pig's tibialis anterior. However, the amplitude went almost to baseline if intensity was increased. So the loss that he saw was able to be overcome by increasing the intensity and probably uh, summating more axons through the other nerve roots that were still intact. He does have some more information out uh, more recently where he's saying that uh, extensor hallucis longus is probably a better uh, muscle to be monitoring on the L5. And since the L5 is the shortest nerve root, that's the one most likely to uh, be injured uh, so you can use that for peripheral monitoring. MEPs are smaller amplitude than supermaximal CMAPs. Since not all axons are stimulated in the transcranial motor of potential, that means some are not monitored. If monitoring nerve roots, each muscle has multiple levels of innervation. If the root damage has a little axonal contribution from the MEP, there may be no change in response or there may or may not meet the established criteria for significant loss. Also, there may be a difference in the amount of axons contributing to the muscle per nerve root, say a C5 and a deltoid. This may also limit sensitivity. So if you have a muscle that's largely uh, monitored or largely innervated by a single level and that level goes out, you might have a significant loss. If you have one that is not that great, like a C6 on a bicep, uh, and it's mostly C5, it might not meet your alarm criteria. <clears throat> MEPs and ischemia. Since MEPs monitor the, the more metabolically demanding gray matter, they will usually go out first, and that will happen within two to three minutes. SSCPs and D waves monitor white tracks and may show more delayed responses if they change at all. And remember, this uh, the cord has uh, different vascular supply where the anterior portion of the cord is less well representative, where the posterior has this web-like formation that goes up and down the back of the, the cord. Uh, 
Can you go over some of the weaknesses associated with motor vote potentials? So weaknesses include the following. There's differing depth of cortical spinal stimulation from cortex down to medulla. So sometimes we're stimulating gray matter, sometimes we're stimulating white tract matter. They can go deep down, all the way down to the level of the medulla. Eye waves or the indirect waves are sensitive to anesthesia, facilitation, fade, prerolandic cortical disturbances. Uh, synchronous and asynchronous conduction through a small portion of fast conducting thick myelin, so it's not uh, it's not in use in all the time. Synaptic transfer from cortical spinal to lower motor neuron uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. Fluctuating lower motor neurons sensitive to anesthesia, fade, and facilitation. Modulation over lower motor neuron dis disrupted by spinal cord dissection. Firing of a small and changing subpopulations of lower motor neurons. Neuromuscular junction sensitive to neuromuscular blockade. Peripheral conduction in a small and changing subpopulation of lower motor neurons. So when we stimulate, we stimulate a very small population. That small population is changing from the area of initial stimulation to the area summated at the anterior horn. Uh, there is inhibitory feedback loops at play also in the inhibitory. It's very prone to anesthetic and just this natural fade phenomenon. So there's a lot of uh, variables that come into play with an emotive vote potential. Aren't there other forms of motor vote potentials that we might use? So there's trans transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is used in awake patients for a, a lot of variable things. Uh, used for diagnostic purposes for problems with motor systems like a stroke, multiple sclerosis, ALS, and other cranial nerve and problems with the spinal cord. Can also be used for therapy for things like depression. Can be used in the awake patient without pain. Was looked at for intraoperative monitoring, but smaller responses marked suppression with anesthetic agents and difficulty with stabilization of the magnetic coil makes it un under desirable. So slight movements of that big coil cause big problems in uh, your recording. Another type that was uh, done earlier in the neuromonitoring world but is no longer used is direct spinal cord stimulation. Stimulation of the spinal cord rostral to the surgical site. Uh, spinal cord stimulation is not selective. This leads to the possibility of undetected motor tract damage. Peripheral nerve responses, or CNAPs, formerly known as neurogenic motor vote potentials, were eventually shown to be mostly antidromic sensory potentials containing no reliable motor information. So what was happening is they were stimulating, uh, you see the electrodes here, they, they placed these percutaneous stimulation around the level of the spinal cord. They'd stimulate and the patient would have this huge buck and they say, wow, look at all that big motor response. What they come to find that it was mostly antidromic dorsal column sensory pathways that were being monitored. And if they did have a, a change to the cord that was in the lateral cortical spinal tracts or the anterior horn, they were going undetected because we still had enough of that antidromic pathway intact and you had the false negative response. Stimulation of muscles or CMAPs could include antidromic volleys and dorsal column 1A afferent axons whose collateral branches form monosynaptic excitatory synapses with alpha motor neurons. Excessive patient movement uh, was another downside. Probably not better than SSCPs for detecting sensory deficits and it's an invasive procedure. Okay, that is it for motor evoked potentials. Um, this is just a quick reminder that I do not hide my email address or, or even phone number or find me on LinkedIn or Facebook. If you have a question for me about the field or whatever, if you need to discuss something, my information is there. If it is a general uh, neuromonitoring question, I refer back to uh, putting it on the forum so myself and others in the field can help lend some help there. Okay, that's it for this video.